Um, well, as Pete already said this morning, we have, we've come back from a, we call it a weekend, but it wasn't a weekend really, it was a Thursday to Sunday, um, but our time away at Focus, our network, church, um, sort of gathering away from our normal, our local context and communities, a time to get away, to be together and to be re-envisioned um, for all that we are doing back in our local communities and also in our personal lives with Jesus. And as Pete said, one of the things that we were really encouraged by um, from the teaching um, and uh, that, was, that was happening at Focus was the way that it really felt like it was just pressing into all that we have been pressing into here, this journey that we have been going on here as Church Crawley, Church at St. John's, at St. Peter's and at St. Richard's, of being hungry for Jesus, of seeking God with all that we have. And we've been in this season where we've been uh, stewarding uh, two words that Steve and Liz felt that God really gave to them for this season, and that is to diligently seek with all that we have to press into God, to find him, to search for him in his word, in worship and in prayer. And we've been doing that through um, the gospel of Mark. We've been uh, bit by bit going through Mark's gospel and seeing what we can take from that, where we can find Jesus in that. And so that is what we are doing today. We are continuing through the Gospel of Mark. And today we are reading from Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. And, and it's these kind of these two accounts, but we're going to read them together. The account of Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath, and then crowds following Jesus. And, and so the passage is going to come up on the screens. There are pew Bibles if you want to grab one of those to follow along with. Um, so, Mark 3, verses 1 to 12. Another time, and, um, and here we really get this sense that Mark, the, the author Mark, is, is building a picture of Jesus and who he is. He is he's sort of gathering this portfolio of evidence that displays Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. So another time, Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them, and we can assume that um, this means the Pharisees, were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus then withdrew with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because, the, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. In these two scenes, we have Jesus continuing to reveal his messianic identity as he performs miracles of healings and displays his authority over spirits He's showing himself to be Lord over creation and also over the Sabbath as he uh, claimed in the verses before at the end of chapter 2 which we looked at two weeks ago. He is showing himself to be Lord over all things and we also see in these passages how people are responding to him. And I was, as I was preparing for today, it was these responses of different people throughout these passages that I really felt God drawing me to. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on a bit today. 
Whenever I read through the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and I see how different people responded to him and to his teachings and to his miracles, some responding in very exemplary ways and others in ways that um, sort of make us think, oh my gosh, guys, why aren't you getting this? It's so obvious. And I always wonder to myself, how on earth would I have responded if I was them? Would I have been able to see Jesus for who he was revealing himself to be? Would my heart have been open to the possibility that this man was the Messiah, the saviour that we had been waiting for, just not quite what we'd expected him to be like? Or would cynicism and scepticism have got in the way for me? Would I have been brave enough to to let go of a religious system that I had maybe grown up in and that generations of my family had followed in order to step into the new kingdom and the new way of life that some peace-loving, tunic-wearing hippie character is suddenly now proclaiming and inviting people to be a part of? Having grown up um, in a Christian family, and so never really having this um, sort of perceptible conversion experience that, that I've been aware of, I'm always so in awe of people who become Christians later on in their life, you know, who very distinctly go from not being a Christian to being a Christian. The only thing I think I guess I can compare it to is um, going from not being a vegan to being a vegan. You have to make changes in your life that are in line with your new convictions. Your friends and your family, they don't really understand why you've done it. They think you've been brainwashed and that it's just a phase that will pass. All of a sudden, people feel like there's things they can't say or do around you, like eating meat or saying the word dairy. You have to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for your decision, but you feel better for it. I've heard some people say that if a person were to come face to face with Jesus, with the awe and wonder and beauty and majesty of who he is, that they wouldn't be able to help but to fall in love with him and give their lives to him and follow him. And to some degree, you know, that makes sense to me. I really do believe that. I believe that the presence and the person of Jesus is so beautiful and so attractive that surely, you know, logically, no one would be able to refuse or reject Jesus. But the reality is that the depths of the human heart with our emotions and our wills and our fears is complex and often hidden to us And so I'm just not sure that it's quite that simple. And in both of the scenes in our passages for today, we do see people knowing who Jesus was and what he could do. But this knowledge is not the same as love and discipleship for Jesus. In the first scene, we have Jesus has come to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, a day of rest and of worship, And he encounters there a man with a shriveled hand. The Pharisees are there too, apparently not to worship their Lord on this holy day with their Jewish brothers and sisters, but to find a reason to accuse Jesus of a religious crime. And we might argue that at one point, it did seem that the religious leaders and the Pharisees had a genuine curiosity about Jesus. You know, they were asking questions about Jesus to try to help them understand who this man was and and how he was doing the things that he was doing, even though they might have been fearful. But here, in this encounter that we're reading today, there is a shift. They're no longer trying to understand. They are just looking to accuse And there is something deeply sad about hard hearts in God's own people. The Pharisees, they are here in their place of worship. And yet it's like the way they've been worshipping and the things that they have been worshipping has not opened their hearts to desire the kingdom 
of God and to recognize God in their midst. And perhaps that's because they've built altars to the wrong things. You know, recently we've been talking about these altars that we can build in our hearts, in our homes, in our church and in our region. And we can build these to the wrong things. They've built them to the law and to themselves, to self-righteousness. And so in this place of worship, we know that the Pharisees aren't even there to worship God but to bring Jesus down. And as Jesus performs a healing miracle, they don't respond with awe and wonder, but with cynicism and with a desire to destroy. Unlike our gospel writer Mark, who is building up this picture, this portfolio of evidence for Jesus' messianic identity, the Pharisees here are seeking to amount evidence that would condemn Jesus. And I have to think that it's because of fear that they were acting, they were responding in this way. Fear and insecurity and jealousy, things that we'll all be familiar with. And you know what? If we're not careful, these ways of thinking and responding, this posture of heart, of cynicism and seeking reasons to criticise, they can really easily creep into our lives, into our relationships, into our relationship with the church. When Pete and I were in our first year of marriage and uh, living together, learning to live together, I was guilty of this. There would be um, a task that I saw needed to be done in the house, let's say washing up, um, or something that needed to be bought from the shop, But I didn't want to have to ask Pete to do it. I wanted him also to notice and to do it without me having to ask. And so I would just sort of wait. I'd sort of walk past it, looking at it pointedly, and I would wait. And if Pete didn't do it, I would get bitter and annoyed. It's like I was setting him up to fail, like I was, you know, just lying in wait to criticise him. And I know that that doesn't show me in the best light, It was such an ugly posture of heart to have and I've really tried to consciously work on it because it is not loving and instead it comes from self-concern and insecurity but these things they can creep into our hearts and they can be toxic and they can cause destruction. Jesus would have known the hearts of the Pharisees He would have known that they were sitting in wait for reason to accuse him. In other encounters like this in the gospel, we read things like Jesus knew their hearts or he knew their thoughts. And yet the certainty of the criticism and persecution that was to come for Jesus, it didn't deter him from doing what the father was asking of him in that situation to bring healing and restoration And so Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, heals on the Sabbath. But he didn't, you know, do it, but do it in secret. He performed this healing in a very public, very visible way, making the man that Jesus wanted to heal stand before everyone in the synagogue. Because he wanted to use this moment to teach everyone who was gathered there to speak to the empty and hard hearts that had come about from this this pharisaic way of religious rule keeping, this legalism and this idolatry which was keeping them not only from the freedom that Jesus had come to give, but was also keeping them from living in the way of love. And what Jesus says in this moment when he, um, he teaches, or he challenges the Pharisees, he says, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? He's echoing the message of so many of the prophets of old, of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, prophets God sent to the people of God in the Old Testament to warn them about their heartlessness and the emptiness of their worship. Through these prophets in the Old Testament, God effectively said to his people, I see you doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, but your worship is empty 
because I don't see you loving those in need and showing compassion and doing good. And here the same challenge comes from Jesus as he says effectively, you know, what good is your law keeping and your religious practices if they are stopping you from doing good and instead causing you to become agents of evil? Because the Pharisees' law keeping practices, such as those around what was and was not permitted on the Sabbath, these, these laws that weren't just the law that God had given his people, but had been sort of elaborated and added to by humans, they had become a closed door to the work of God in such a way that that healing had become purely an act of work which must not be done on the Sabbath rather than something which was a sign of God's kingdom on earth and which expressed God's love for his people. But not only that, they are actively plotting to murder Jesus, to kill, to be agents of death because they felt threatened by his power and his influence and by the change that Jesus was bringing. And so what Jesus is really doing here is, is contrasting the murderous plots of the law-keeping, righteous Pharisees with his desire, with God's desire to heal and restore and bring life and saying, you know, which do you think is right here? Which do you think will hurt God more? Which do you think is better in the eyes of God? to bring life or to destroy it. And as we read, it's like, it's like the Pharisees just don't hear what Jesus is saying. They can't see it. They've become blind to their own destructive hearts. The hard hearts and the evil intentions of the Pharisees and also the, the sort of the passivity of those others gathered in the synagogue, it grieved Jesus it distressed him, it made him angry. This is what hurts God. This is what angers God. When our hearts are empty, when there is no love. But really interestingly, how does Jesus respond in his grief, in his anger and his despair? He brings the kingdom of God by healing a hurting man. This healing is almost almost portrayed as a bit of a, a protest, a protest against the hard-heartedness, the emptiness of the Pharisees. In the face of evil, Jesus presses into life, into light and into goodness, into love and compassion, into seeing the kingdom of God come in this world. And I think that this needs to be a model for us too, because there are things in this world that will grieve us and anger us. There's injustice and oppression and persecution. There's evil that we see. There's apathy, neglect. There's abuse and war, perversion, corruption. All of these things are out there. They are real and they ought to stir us. They ought to cause us pain to evoke an emotional response in us as we witness these things which bring death and destruction instead of life. Last weekend, I was um, really challenged by some teaching of one of the speakers about prayer, about how we are called to pray, about how our whole beings should be affected by these things that we see in the world. And he was inviting us to allow ourselves to be overcome, to be overwhelmed in a way that stirs us to cry out in desperation for God's kingdom to come. And here in our passage for today, in Jesus' actions, we see a similar, a similar movement, a similar response modelled, that when we are faced with darkness and evil that grieves us, as the people of God, we are called to respond by pressing into light and love and mercy. We fight evil with good. We fight darkness with light. And so we see here in this first scene, people responding to God with hard hearts, 
with empty hearts. And we also see Jesus calling us to press into light and life and the kingdom of God. As we move on to the second scene in our passage then, after leaving the synagogue, Jesus withdraws. He tries to get some solitude and people follow. They gather from all around, some traveling really significant distances because they have heard word of all that Jesus has been doing. You know, this is already the sixth account of Jesus' healing that is reported by Mark in just over two short chapters of his gospel, and one of which was him healing and delivering many people. And word was traveling about this. And people were coming to see the one who all the fuss was about. But what were they there for? For Jesus? Or for a spectacle? For the gift, the blessing, the healing, the miracles? Or for the gift giver? This is the thing about the crowds that we read about throughout the Gospels. It's a bit of a pattern. Crowds are quick to form and they are also quick to dissipate. Even when people have been on the receiving end of a healing miracle. Because how many of these people who flocked to see Jesus perform a miracle... These people who who see, who witness his power and his mercy and his lordship... How many of them actually go on to become a follower of Jesus? Some perhaps, but certainly not all of them. The crowds in our passage, they are there for the spectacle of the power of God, but it's like they're not up for the sacrifice of discipleship to Christ, of the life that Jesus actually calls us to live with him Perhaps today is an invitation for us to search ourselves and to ask, what am I in it for? Are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus? Because you can believe in God and in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit without living in a way that is shaped by those beliefs. And this is what we also see in the evil spirits, both in this encounter that we're looking at today and and earlier in Mark's gospel, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The evil spirits are shown to know who God is. You know, they could even be described as, as having some kind of faith in him. You know, they believed in his power. They believed in his lordship. And they were quicker to recognize Jesus as the Christ than many of Jesus' own followers. And yet their allegiance was still firmly elsewhere. They still served an entirely different God. Earlier this week, I was reading through the book of Daniel with somebody and, um, and having noticed this thing about the crowds and about the spirits in this passage, I started seeing it in lots of other places in scripture too, um, like King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, who bears witness to God's power amongst his prophets to interpret um, the king's dreams and he bears witness to God's power to deliver Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego from the blazing furnace without a scratch. You know, these really pretty impressive miracles. And each time King Nebuchadnezzar is led to glorify God, he's so amazed by what God has done. And yet it's not until at least seven years later, after a period of profound humbling, that Nebuchadnezzar actually repents and turns to God as Lord of his life. Jesus' message is the promise and the hope of God's kingdom coming in our lives and in our world. And it's an invitation to come under its reign. Discipleship, following Jesus living life with him and for him, with him as king over our lives. It's not just about seeing and knowing, but it's about loving and surrendering. It's not just about flocking to Jesus, 
but it's about staying. It's about walking with him, following. It's about intimacy with God, putting ourselves in a place where he is Lord over our lives and where we can be shaped and transformed into the people that he is calling us to be. Because that won't happen if we are at a distance from God and from his presence. But you know, this is hard to do when there are other things in our lives that we aren't really ready to bring under the rule and lordship of God in our lives. It's hard to do when we are comfortable and we don't want things to change. It's hard to do when we're fearful or we're insecure or we're afraid of the work that Jesus might want to do in our lives. You know, the transformation that he might bring, even if we know that it's ultimately for our good. It's even hard when walking with Jesus is not all about the glamorous, sensational, spectacular moments. And instead it's about waiting or about obedience or about sacrifice. And outside of the context of, of the cross, outside of the context of God's love for us, perhaps this can seem like a bit of a raw deal, like a hard ask, but we are only ever giving ourselves in our worship, our lives, our love, our desires to the one who has already given everything for us. We're going to head into a time of taking communion together now as a church. And as we come to communion, we remember that Jesus poured out his blood for us a sign of a new covenant between him and his people, a new promise of relationship with Jesus, one in which we are completely forgiven because he took upon himself our guilt and our shame for our sin. We remember that Jesus offered up his body to be broken on the cross, dying for our sin, but then defeating death and raising to new life again so that we would no longer be overcome by death and destruction and evil. Through the cross, we are invited to become people of God, people of his blood and of his body, of his love and of his sacrifice, people of his mercy and of his kingdom. And as we come to share bread and wine in communion, we are choosing to share in Christ and in the life and the kingdom that comes through him. And as we approach Jesus, as we actively with our bodies, you know, come forward to meet with him in bread and wine, we approach him with repentance, bringing to him maybe those places where we know our hearts are heart to him or the ways in which our worship has become empty or loveless. We bring to him the ways in which perhaps we've become focused on the spectacle and the spiritual highs and forgotten how to follow. And we allow those things to be nailed to the cross so that we can receive God's forgiveness. And we also approach with open hearts that we are wanting to be filled with the presence and the love of God. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus had supper with his disciples. He took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks to God. And he said to his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine. He gave thanks for it. And he said to his disciples, this is my blood of the new covenant, this new relationship, this new way of being with me now, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And so we are going to have a time of taking communion now. Before we do that, I'm just going to pray for us. Pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to help us to prepare our hearts to come to Jesus, to once again respond to him, to all that he has done for us. So Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you for your heart for us and for your world. A heart which breaks at the injustices in the world. Your heart that is angered by death and destruction instead of life. And Lord, we thank you for the way that you don't settle for anything less than all of us coming to you, our whole selves, so that we might live in the life and the freedom that you bring. And God, would you prepare us now to respond to you with a yes, to respond with our whole hearts, our whole minds, and our whole lives. Amen.